Well, Proverbs 11, 14 says that where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. When I think about the local body church, and in particular, the discipleship ministries of that church, I believe this verse speaks to the many of us, the many of you who have been called and gifted and prepared and have great passion for counseling, guiding, teaching, shepherding others. That the Lord has gifted you and the Holy Spirit has prepared you to be a leader, a co-leader, a facilitator among discipleship groups, small groups, journey groups, service groups, ministry teams. And so for the next few minutes, I just want to share with you both the philosophical and the practical uh, steps and ideas and thoughts uh, that we share at River Oaks Community Church in regard to leaderships in discipleship ministries. Often I get questioned, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm new to River Oaks. Uh, what is it? What is the criteria for being a leader? Uh, I've got uh, we've got several couples and we'd like to be our own group. Can I lead that group? What does that look like? Or sometimes I get, well, you know, I don't think I'm quite ready. I'm not really sure I could do it. Um, do I really have the gifts and the skills to do that? And so hopefully over the next few minutes here, you'll be encouraged. Uh, you'll get your answers as to how we approach leadership and, and uh, the vetting and uh, the, uh, the criteria, uh, the qualifications, primarily biblically, but also uh, from a, um, uh, an accountability of the church and the administrative aspect of the church and leadership. And so I just hope that you'll, you'll share with that. And if the Lord has been prompting you, uh, has been preparing you, uh, the church needs you. Uh, discipleship ministries need you. More and more individuals and families are, are coming and visiting River Oaks and looking for community, looking for connection, looking for spiritual growth, looking for someone to come alongside them to lead them to co-lead co uh, with others, to facilitate group conversation. And so we really would encourage you to pursue that calling, uh, a calling which I think scripturally would say in obedience, and to do so uh, within community and with the right heart and uh, the right perspective of what it means to be a, a leader with a biblical worldview. So let's talk about that. And the first thing I just want to do is I wanted to share a couple of verses that I think really speak to uh, the philosophical or the theological approach that we would have to someone who calls himself a leader. Now, we can look at it in many ways. We see the proverb, but also I like to think about Romans 12. Paul is giving this overview of the uh, one body and yet many parts. And he talks about all the ways that we have these parts and we are to use them in order that the body might function. Verse 6, it says, you know, having these gifts that differ according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. And he goes on to say, if service, if prophecy, the one who teach in their teaching. And the most important thing I think we see in that whole passage is that Paul is, he's imploring, he's, he's saying, use the gift. Otherwise, uh, we have wasted the gift. And what a tragedy for us to go through this, this life journey, this earthly journey, one that we have been commissioned uh, to go and make disciples. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been commissioned to grow in the understanding of the gospel in order that you might share it and teach it and make disciples. And if that gift has been given to you in any way uh, that is part teaching, uh, what a waste not to be able to use that. And so use them. I also like what we see in Ephesians, again from Paul, same sort of thing. He talks about the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and or the preachers, and then the teachers uh, to, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Why are we teachers? Why are we called to leading a small group, co-leading a journey group, uh, whatever it might be, being over moms or women of the word? Well, for equipping the saints for the work of ministry. It's for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so our first perspective of what it means to lead is really that we're, we're being called alongside with this great privilege and this great responsibility to help equip one another. Likewise, uh, how, how do we do this? What is the model for this? 
you know, there's, there's a model that is very uh, secular worldview, uh, perhaps maybe in your workplace, uh, in uh, maybe an organization or an academic environment where leadership looks possibly very authoritarian. Uh, it looks very uh, powerful. Uh, there is great prestige, perhaps, with leadership. Our model is much different, though. And so we have to make sure that we have a heart for a biblical model. And for that, we, we obviously look to Christ. I think in Matthew 20, uh, verses 26 through 28, it says that, uh, you know, here, here is the model of leadership. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As a leader, we want to each walk into those groups, if we're leading whatever that might be, a group, a team, um, a project, a ministry. And every time we walk in that room, every time we get around that table, are we the least important person in that room? In our heart, do we, do we genuinely and sincerely believe that we are the least important person at that table? That's what it means to be selflessly uh, submitted and committed uh, to be a servant to all. That's the upside down leadership that Christ gives us a model for. I think it's interesting too. I wanted to maybe just go back a little bit. I had those couple passages, but in, uh, right before uh, we hear that about what that means, uh, you know, in verse 25, it's the opposite. It is that worldly view of leadership. But uh, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. The leaders of the Gentiles, the leaders of the world, non believers, and their great men exercise authority over them. In other words, what it looks like in the world is that leadership is, is lorded over you. The authority is exercised over each and every person. I am the leader and you are not. And then he gives that contradiction. He gives the, the opposite, that, that counterintuitive idea of now what it means to be a leader in my kingdom, Jesus says, is exactly the opposite of that. And so we want to have a heart for that. We want all of our leaders, we want each of us to have a heart for that when it comes to leading. And how do we do that? Well, I believe we do it best when we look at the advice of, uh, again, Paul to the uh, church at Philippi, the Philippians. And we look at uh, chapter 2, where he's, he's, he's talking about a, ch a church and a church body that's doing things pretty well. There's great joy among uh, the brothers and sisters there. Uh, there's great unity there. Uh, there's great understanding, and yet his message is continue to grow in that, continue to mature in that. Don't become complacent in that. And here's, here's how you do it. Here's how you serve one another in that. And it starts, uh, say, in, in chapter 2, he says, you know, you can do this. You can remain united in spirit, intent on one purpose. I love that in verse 2, actually. And then in 3, by doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have the attitude in yourselves, which is not just being asked of you, but the attitude which was also in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he gave that up. Right? He emptied himself and he took the form of man. So pure sacrifice, pure selflessness, that's starting to shape what it looks like to be a leader and what we would like to continue to grow uh, as and, and represent as leaders throughout the discipleship ministry. And we believe we are so blessed because we, we have so many who, who demonstrate that, who live that out on, our, on a regular basis. And we're so thankful uh, to be able to see that and to grow in that. And we know there are many of you who uh, have not um, have not shared that gift with us, and we would love uh, for you to do that. So, really, just again, um, theologically, what it means, what it looks like, uh, what are the values and the virtues: humility, compassion, patience, <laughs> kindness. Uh, I think faithfulness, uh, availability, vulnerability. The leader must also be the most vulnerable person in the group. 
willing to share, willing to trust, willing to be honest and transparent. Those are the leaders that the church can really use and discipleship ministries uh, can, can really uh, grow from and benefit from. And so those are the qualifications, at least scripturally. Now, let's say you're saying, yeah, I understand. Uh, so how do I get started? How, how do I become a leader? How, how if I'm available if you need me? Just, you know, put me in coach. Well, there's a couple of steps that we ask of all of our leaders. The first is this, is that we do require all of our leaders within discipleship ministries uh, to be members of River Oaks. Now, that's really about the only place that we require membership uh, in positions. We, uh, all of our groups are open to not only attendees and members of River Oaks, but the community at large, members of other churches. We welcome to groups, to, to ministries, to events, whatever it may be. But as a leader of a group, we do uh, believe as well as scripture tells us, there is a greater responsibility and uh, a greater burden to ensure that we are walking hand in hand with the essentials of our faith. Uh, that we are uh, followers of Christ in a very genuine and assured way, uh, that we uphold to the uh, essential doctrines of the church, that we are under the accountability of the church. And so as a member of a group, you can be assured that your leader is a member of River Oaks. And uh, so we do ask you that. And of course, you can go through Discover Rock to find out more about River Oaks and you can ask us at any time. The second is We this. do ask you to fill out one of these leader questionnaires now, this isn't uh, an assessment. Uh, this isn't uh, any sort of test. This is simply a way for you to reflect on why it is you believe you're called to, to leading a group. What, what are those skills, gifts, experiences? What are some of the things in your life that have helped prepare you for this? Uh, where do you stand theologically? Are there uh, any objections uh, to the passages in Titus or Timothy? relative to what a leader should be like and, and, and look like and act like and, um, and speak like. Uh, and, um, and also an opportunity for me and uh, our discipleship group to get to know you a little bit better. We love to hear your story. And so you'll fill out one of these questionnaires and then you and I will have a, an opportunity uh, to, to sit down and talk about it. Again, I just want to hear your story. It helps understand the dynamics perhaps of the group that you're looking uh, to, be, uh, to be grouped with. Uh, perhaps it helps with the dynamics of life experiences, uh, other individuals, personalities, those sort of things um, that you've had experience teaching. And we always make sure to say that uh, you may be very new to our church community here, uh, the local body, but you may have a wealth of uh, experience uh, teaching Sunday schools. Uh, perhaps leading groups elsewhere, uh, over ministries, maybe even pastoring in another church. And uh, we want you to step in and we want you to feel like you can get going right away. So it's not a matter of tenure, so to speak, at River Oaks. It's really a matter of, of, of life's tenure and your willingness and, and uh, the, the uh, heeding of that call and the gifts that God has given you. So we'll, we'll want to make sure to remember, we're going to have a questionnaire and then we're going to have a conversation. And so that's, that's really the basic criteria that we want to make sure that we're vetting. And that again, we can, we can feel like our, our um, members of groups can be confident uh, that um, we, we know the leaders that are being put in place across uh, the campus and across uh, the various ministries. Now, I will tell you too, I want to talk about support real quick. So a lot of folks will say, well, gosh, I don't know. You know I've been sitting in a small group. And uh, it seems like the leader is always prepared, and uh, I just don't know Scripture that well. Again, we're, we're growing together. You know, there's, there's, regardless of our starting point, the desire to step in and to be in Scripture together is more important than the, uh, the, uh, the amount of Scripture that you come with and you know and the understanding of, of, of God's Word. Uh, so wherever you might be, you should also know, and maybe your leader's not telling you this, but we do offer a, a, a good bit of leader support that we want to make available to you. Throughout all the small group sessions, the leaders receive a weekly uh, supplemental email. Uh, commentary, uh, provide some input on maybe some of those questions that might be hard to handle this week. We help try to provide a little bit of prompting, maybe some ideas for discussion points, some background to the passage, some background just to the context, historical 
uh, cultural context, biblical context. And so maybe your leader is, is just really utilizing those sources as well too, but you, you would get that as well. We have a uh, semi-annually, we do it in January and August, a leader kickoff, uh, appreciation, fellowship, dinner, and then we also have a time of equipping where we'll talk about the actual upcoming season and maybe we'll equip in some other sort of um, matter of, of, of spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. Uh, we try to have an annual retreat for all of our leaders and then continue to pour into and be available for any support that our leaders uh, might require. So, of course, we are building a, a database, really an archive of equipping classes on various topics and subject matters. So maybe you, you feel like, well, I'm going to get questions about baptism or communion or uh, the tabernacle of the Old Testament, or how did we get our Bible and can we really believe in the validity of what's before us? Because my translation looks different than their translation. How do I answer that? You know, all of those topics and so many more uh, have been covered in our equipping classes. We have a, a large library now of those equipping classes, which you can go, you can use as resources yourself, or you can pass them along to others and say, that's a great question. I don't know. How about you watch that one class that they did for equipping on the, on the subject of church history? I'm not sure how we, the stream of Christianity branched from, you know, one universal Catholic church to an Orthodox church and a Roman Catholic church and a Protestant church. We've talked about that, giving you some, some support there. So that's out there as well. And that's really, that's really all I wanted to share. Didn't want to take a lot of time. I wanted to at least maybe uh, give you a flavor of what it looks like, what it uh, might could look like, and, and the steps you can take to let us know that you're interested in, in being a leader among our discipleship ministries, or a co-leader, or a facilitator. So please let us know, and think about that, pray about it, let us know if we can pray about it with you, and until we have that conversation, I want to leave you with, with uh, the, the verse and the passage that truly is the uh, foundational passage, understanding of discipleship ministries as a whole here at River Oaks, and that's in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, where Paul has just told his readers, church at Colossae, that you know, he had been made a minister, a shepherd, a teacher to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel was now that mystery that has been revealed. It has been revealed and now available to the Gentiles, to Jews and Greeks. And, and because of that, that's why he uh, had been called and, and can share that. And he goes on to further say, and this is what I really believe is the objective and the mission of leaders in all aspects and in all areas of discipleship and the local body church. And he goes on to say that it is him, Jesus, we proclaim admonishing everyone, warning everyone, teaching everyone with the wisdom, and that's the wisdom given by the Holy Spirit, that, may, that we may present everyone mature or complete in Christ. For that purpose, I toil, I labor. And I think that's where we can say we labor, we toil, we struggle, we strive. To, with all the power which works within me. The power of Christ that works within me. What a powerful passage. That's why we do it. Christ-like maturity. Selflessly, um, faithfully, humbly coming alongside others to say wherever we are today, let's all move toward more Christ-likeness tomorrow. How can I help uh, foster an environment for which we take a step toward greater maturity, greater Christ-likeness tomorrow than where we are today. That's the objective and the mission of leaders, uh, well, within the church as a whole, as should be from a, a biblical standpoint. And again, blessings on your day. Please let us know if there's anything we can do for you.